Hello everyone. Many thanks for joining this, the second webinar in the series on Source to Sea. Uh, my name is Gareth James Lloyd and I work at the UNFDHI Partnership. It's my job to be your facilitator of the webinar today and with me is Maya Batule, also of UNFDHI and Maya is going to be providing the technical support. Um, just briefly, this webinar series aims to highlight the importance of understanding uh, the connections needed to achieve SDG 6 on freshwater and SDG 14 on oceans. And in more direct terms, what we want to share and discuss with you is the value of integrating efforts to reduce the negative impacts and, and of course, maximize potential benefits of thinking freshwater and oceans together. And what we've done in the series is to gather together a number of experts uh, to present to us and uh, they'll be using their experiences from selected case studies to exemplify the application of approaches on specific issues. Uh, this webinar series is developed in collaboration with the UN Environment, CWE, uh, the UNDP Water Governance Facility and the Action Platform for Source to Sea Management. In the first webinar, we started uh, by setting the scene through introducing key concepts as well as the sustainable development goals and their uh, linkages. The aim was to give participants a solid grasp uh, of the background as well, of course, as the benefits of addressing the challenges of upstream uh, downstream interactions. And as we learned, these interactions uh, are both at policy and uh, management impl implementation levels. Um, in this and the following webinars, the intention is to drill uh, down into uh, these policy and management interactions in several key issue areas. Today we're going to be looking at water quality through some of the experiences of dealing with uh, land-based sources of uh, marine pollution. So, um, we're very pleased to have four experts uh, with us who are going to be sharing their knowledge. Uh, the plan was to only have three, but we managed to squeeze in an extra one at the last moment. Uh, we're going to begin with Peter Kershaw, who's an independent advisor who works very closely with the UN Environment. And Peter will be talking about important steps to reducing land-based sources of plastics and microplastics and their impact on the marine environment. Uh, next up, we have uh, Jenny Hedman of the Swedish Environmental uh, Protection Agency. Jenny will be sharing her experiences on regional action to reduce the amount of pharmaceuticals in the Baltic Sea. And following up on Jenny, uh, we have Christopher Cox of UN Environment GPA. Chris is our last minute guest, but a very welcome one, of course. Uh, we'd almost given up on having someone come in and talk to us about uh, the efforts to uh, rehabilitate and restore Manila Bay. But I'm glad to say that uh, uh, we had Chris step in at the last moment. And uh, I'm sure you're going to find that very interesting. Last but not least, in terms of the presentations, we have Elena. Uh, Guista uh, of uh, ISPRA, the Institute for Environmental Protection and Research in Italy. Elena will be talking about dealing with industrial sources of mercury contam contamination uh, in Italian coastal areas. She's also going to be touching on the lessons learned uh, that uh, are of more general relevance. And uh, back by popular demand, I'm pleased to say we have uh, Begita. Uh, Liz uh, Lima of Siwi, who's our resident Source to Sea expert and is heavily involved in the Source to Sea Action Platform. Uh, we've invited Begita along to, um, to make some brief uh, reflections on the uh, preceding presentations and just basically help us all gather our thoughts together uh, regarding what we've heard and, and some of the lessons from that. Each presentation is going to take uh, 10 minutes. The plan is to allow for uh, one question uh, immediately after each presentation, just to pick on, up on uh, anything uh, immediate 
uh, and of course to break things up just a little. Uh, we'll also be allowing some space uh, for additional questions at the end. And if you, the participants, look on the right of your screen, you will see a panel. And if you have a look down there, you'll see a tab for questions just right in there. Uh, and uh, and send them to us. If you can identify who you'd like uh, the question to be addressed to, uh, that would be a big help. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Maya to pass control over to Peter so he can begin. Peter, can you please uh, accept the invitation to show your screen and also unmute your microphone? And uh, I'll let you know whenever uh, we, we can see and you're ready to go. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Gareth. And uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to, to be here. I've asked to say a little bit about a, a very large topic, uh, so I will be skipping through things. Um, but I'm very happy to follow up with anybody afterwards, and I'll give my address at the end. Um, so uh, just bear with me. So plastics are something which uh, I suspect everyone on the planet now thinks of as indispensable as part of their, their daily lives. They're used for all sorts of um, uh, purposes and it really without them we'd be struggling uh, in, in modern society. Uh, the other aspect of course is, is our, our, the production and our use of plastics has gone up enormously. Uh, in, in the last few decades and it's predicted to go up even further if if present trends uh, are not uh, altered. Um, one of the problems of course is is that with with that use comes a, a very significant impact but it's actually an avoidable impact. Some of the impacts are very uh, obvious as you can see in the images here some are less obvious. Uh, you may have heard of microplastics, which is essentially just small pieces of plastic, um, and they get taken up by organisms, and there are implications uh, for seafood safety from, from the chemicals which are associated with those. So clearly we have uh, uh, a societal problem to deal with, and of course it's all a result of what we do on a daily basis. Now to do something about it, we need to try and identify the intervention points. We need to look at the sources, their relative contributions, uh, how they get from the source to the sea and what impact they're having. So we can target interventions and, and produce some cost-effective measures. This graphic here is, is a, is a, is a, it shows the two main categories of, 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 of plastics. We can think in terms of short-term and single-use plastics. Uh, typically for packaging, uh, but also for sanitary wear and disposable goods of various sorts. And then longer term uh, and multiple use plastics, the sort of things which are used in construction, in domestic appliances, and of course in the ubiquitous uh, electronic goods we, we, uh, we find indispensable these days. If you have a uh, well-developed um, uh, systems for collection and, and, and management. Some of these can be uh, intercepted before they reach waterways in the ocean, but in many parts of the world and even in some of the, the, the better um, uh, developed economies, this often does not happen and these uh, become leakage points to the environment that you must expect very significant regional variations around, around the world. And the two greatest things we could do initially or immediately is to, to try and improve the situation, is, is to improve collection and management, both of wastewater and solid waste, and also to wean ourselves off uh, single-use uh, plastics as, as far as is, is practical. Um, now, in reducing the loss of plastics, we talk about intervention points and, and we can think about reducing the quantity of material we use in the first place. We can redesign products and that uh, perhaps will help us reduce the amount being used. We may be able to remove certain items from, from normal use. 
We can reuse materials. For example, it's happening in the automobile industry now. And of course, we can recycle. And if that all else fails, um, and we still end up with a waste stream, uh, we can then recover the energy from that. And you can think of that as the six R's. And, uh, and that's all part of it. Those are all elements of, of, of a circular economy. Now, in, in, in adopting these various measures, you have to be aware, as, as always in life, of unexpected consequences. Um, I, I guess most of you have probably used a, a plastic bottle like this for, for, for drinks. It's very often made of a plastic called polyethylene terephthalate, or PET. And it's one of the, the, the items which is, is most commonly recycled. Um, it's, it's very readily recycled, very high rates of recycling. And you think that's a good thing. Well, it is. But what most people probably don't realize is that most of that PET does not go back into making more bottles, but goes into making non-packaging items, particularly textiles. And, of course, in textiles, um, they get washed uh, or they get worn if it's, if it's uh, say, a carpet. And what happens is during that, those, that, that uh, washing process, very many, uh, I mean, the upwards of thousands of fibers are released. And those are then, in, in most cases, will be released into wastewater. So you're tackling one problem, but in a sense, you're then creating another problem and that's an example which uh, is quite a, a good one but one suspects there are probably other instances of that happening if you're interested in, 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 in this uh, particular issue there's a couple of European projects going on at the moment looking at this one specifically on fiber release from clothing and the other one looking at uh, releases from multiple sources it's one of the things we find when we start looking at microplastics, these very small items, is they come from a different variety of sources. Um, the ones you may have heard about are from personal care products, often known as microbeads. You find them in toothpaste and facial rubs. But there are also other ones which are deliberately uh, made for particular industrial applications, for example. But then there's a whole series of what we call secondary, which uh, uh, have fragmented from, from some original item, like the fibers from clothing. But also, we think uh, an enormous quantity of, of tire dust, um, uh, which contains all sorts of different types of plastic. And there's also, of course, fragmentation of, uh, of, of from mag macroplastics. And in very many cases, this stuff, uh, even with wastewater treatment in place, uh, will not get picked up. It will do in, in, the most, um, in, in the most sophisticated, for example, in Sweden, but then that material then gets used uh, in agriculture and you find those microplastics uh, in, in agricultural land. So you don't get rid of it. Um, and really, the, the, the things, the obvious things to do are to try and reduce accidental and operational losses uh, and improve collection and treatment of wastewater and solid waste. The personal care products is the easiest one to deal with. You can, you, can, you can persuade companies not to use them. But in fact, it's a fairly trivial quantity of material when you look at, compare it with some of the other sources. Now... I would recommend, um, partly because I helped write it, but I would recommend you look at this report. Um, clearly what we need is a multi-agency stakeholder response. And this report, which came out last year, the, uh, the United Nations Environment Assembly is, is designed to encourage that. Uh, in particular, there's a section called Taking Action, where it comes up with um, a sort of practical uh, a framework and then practical measures of, of looking at how uh, society and different stakeholders can, can each play their part. It comes up with a variety of management measures, how you uh, assess the risk and select the right response. And finally, how you um, need to be able to monitor the environment 
adequately so you can uh, tell whether or not any measures which you do introduce are effective or not. It also has something in there about selecting the priorities from a risk-based assessment. This is maybe a complicated diagram to look at, but if you go to the original report, there's quite a good explanation of it. Basically, it's about where in the, of the system do you target, which bit of it. Um, and the little boxes down below, BAT refers to best available technologies, BEP is best environmental practices, MBI is market-based instruments. In other words, there are a whole host of possible measures that can be introduced, and those need to be um, selected according to the particular circumstances of the source you're looking at, where you are, the level of uh, education, the population, the degree of infrastructure development, et cetera, et cetera. Um, clearly, as always, as I've already been mentioned, there's a link here to the sustainable development goals. Um, uh, from a marine perspective, I'm a marine scientist, I think of SDG 14, but um, there, there are a number of other targets, and, and it's, it's not just uh, the, the, the freshwater, but as you can see there, there are a number of, of, of SDG targets, which if you, if, you make, if you make progress in dealing with those, you are automatically going to, be, um, going to have benefit in terms of reducing uh, marine litter in the, the marine environment. So finally, um, uh, after this very quick whiz through the topic, I leave you to, uh, with this to remember the six R's, uh, because that's a, a quite a good uh, philosophy, I think, uh, to, to approach this problem. And I'll say thank you and goodbye, but there is my contact details, and I'd be very happy um, to, to follow up um, with you on, on the topic. So thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much as well, Peter. That was a very enjoyable and uh, educational presentation and, and great that you linked to some additional material. A very quick question for you, just before we move on. Um, you, you talked about one of the options uh, of being, in terms of microplastics, of, of treating the wastewater. Uh, what are the options for treating water? Uh, are some solutions uh, more applicable in some geographies, or should we simply be looking at avoidance, or is that unrealistic? Uh, well, I, uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent question. I'm not sure I can give it an excellent answer. Um, I think geographies are quite important. I think um, hydrographies, I think meteorology, I think how um, wastewater is generated and the extent to which it is collected and kept separate from industrial waste, for example, that just within Europe uh, and within countries in Europe uh, varies tremendously. Um, the, 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 the point about in Sweden where they achieve very good retention times, I believe, in, in wastewater treatment is that that material as sewage sludge is often reused on the land. You then have to ask the question, is this appropriate or not? Um, and you then have to do some sort of risk assessment because what you, I mean, it is otherwise extremely difficult um, to, to selectively remove. That's a, really a question for a, um, a municipal water engineer, I think. But it's, it's, uh, it's something which we're going to have to look at much more carefully. Okay. Oh, no, very interesting. Many thanks for that, Peter. Please stay with us. Uh, Maya, please, could you hand over the presentation rights to Jenny? Okay. Can you and hear me as well? Can. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. So, thank you for giving me the opportunity to give this presentation. My name is Jenny Hedman, and I work at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. I'll be giving this presentation in my capacity as the coordinator of work with hazardous substances within a structure called the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region. Um, the Baltic Sea is located in the northern parts of Europe. It's a semi-enclosed and shallow sea with brackish water and low biodiversity, making it also a sensitive sea, which has been acknowledged by the IMO as a particularly sensitive area. It's surrounded by nine countries, 
and has a very large drainage area with about 90 million inhabitants in it. So the pressures from land-based sources on the sea is very high. The EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region um, was launched by the European Union in 2009. Um, it's a new form of cooperation within Europe. Um, it aims to increase the cooperation between the countries to address common challenges. And one of them, of course, being then um, the, the state of the Baltic Sea, which is one of the main objectives of the strategy. Um, there are a number of thematic policy areas contributing to this uh, objective, and one of them is the policy area hazards that I'm uh, coordinating, uh, working towards reducing emissions and effects of hazardous substances in, in the Baltic Sea. Our aim is to be a link between policy priorities on the regional level and their implementation. And uh, we do that by, for example, uh, supporting uh, alignment of funding to projects or activities that are relevant for the implementation of policy priorities. But we also support the development of, of regional policy. And in the Baltic Sea region, HELCOM is the main policy uh, setting actor. Uh, it's the Helsinki Convention established already in 1974 for the protection of the Baltic Sea uh, environment. And we are working very closely together with HELCOM to make sure that the policy priorities and the implementation activities that we're supporting are in line. And one of those priorities that we have been working on for, for some years now are pharmaceuticals. Um, the issue of, of effects of pharmaceuticals in the environment uh, was perhaps brought to the wider attention in sort of the mid-1990s uh, when it was clear that um, fish in UK rivers downstream a wastewater treatment plant were changing sex or uh, had this intersex um, uh, characteristics and it was connected to their exposure to synthetic estrogens that you can find in contraceptive pills. And since then, since the early 2000s, the, the number of scientific publications when it comes to effects of various types of pharmaceuticals on various uh, species have increased more or less exponentially. Um, there are some 2,000 different pharmaceutical substances on the European market. That does not include um, the transformation products uh, that can also have an effect on, on um, and the environment. Um, these substances, I mean, it's a heterogenic group, so they will have different characteristics. Some are, for example, persistent, while others are easily degradable. Uh, some are water soluble, some less, for example, so that would um, uh, affect their fate in the environment. Uh, but what they do have in common is that they are all designed to have a therapeutic effect, so they are biologically active in some way. And this means that, of course, that they can also have very different effects, but that some of them are also um, having an effect in, in quite low concentrations. Um, the policy response to this um, uh, concern when it comes to the effects in the environment has been coming in the later decade. Within the EU, for example, um, six pharmaceutical substances were put on the so-called watch list, requiring the member states to monitor these substances in the water environment for a number of years for them to evaluate uh, the size of the, the scale of the problem in the European environment. Uh, the e Commission has also um, been requested to set up a strategy on pharmaceuticals in the environment. This has been a bit delayed, but it's now planned for to come out next year in 2018. On the international level, uh, SICOM adopted uh, persistent pharmaceutical pollutants as an emerging policy issue in 2015. 
And on the regional level, uh, within the Baltic Sea region, Halcom first addressed pharmaceuticals in 2010, saying that we need to assess the occurrence and evaluate their effects, which was then follow up, followed up in 2013 um, to collect information and develop measures. And these are um, the incentives that we have worked with from the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region and the policy area hazards to support the implementation uh, um, of the, these policy priorities. And so we joined forces with HELCOM starting a joint process in 2015 to address the issue of pharmaceuticals in the environment. Uh, firstly, we um, decided to, to do a status report on pharmaceuticals in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, this report uh, is also a little bit delayed. It will be published, we hope, now in, in June this year uh, under uh, a series, a uh, UNESCO series. What we did was that we uh, collected information about uh, sources in terms of production, the sales and consumption of pharmaceuticals and how uh, they are managed in the waste um, stage in different countries. We then also collected actual monitoring data or environmental data uh, from wastewater treatment plants, rivers, and the Baltic Sea uh, itself, water sediment and biota. Um, the environmental data, we collected more than 50,000 individual data points and around, well, a little bit less than 200 uh, individual pharmaceutical substances uh, had been analyzed for in the Baltic region. This is showing the, the concentrations that we could find in the wastewater treatment plants around the Baltic Sea. So around 150 or plus subst different types of substances were analyzed in in and outgoing water in wastewater treatment plants. And you can see that more than 90% of what we're looking for, we can find. Um, the same goes for sludge, which almost 90% of the substances, the 60 or so substances that were measured for, were found. And it was concluded that there is no or very low removal of pharmaceutical substances going out, uh, for more than 50% of these substances going out from the wastewater treatment plant, which is not really surprising, but it just confirms uh, what we already knew. However, coming out into the environment, um, of course, the detection level is lower. However, we still find about two-thirds of the uh, more than uh, 100 different substances that we're looking for, both in river, uh, ri that's water samples mainly, but also in the open Baltic Sea. And that was quite surprising to, to many of us that we could find uh, so many different substances, um, even in open water. The sources of, of pharmaceuticals to the environment, um, are, it's not very complicated. You have veterinary pharmaceuticals given either to livestock um, on land. Um, they will excrete it to manure, which will then be the source, the pathway of the of the pharmaceutical uh, runoff to water environment or uh, direct application in aquaculture. When it comes to human pharmaceuticals, um, the main uh, source is the excreted products after consumption and then going out uh, either through the wastewater treatment plant or depending on what kind of uh, wastewater water collection system you have. We also have um, point sources, for example, at the, the you know, production of, of uh, production facilities, which is a big problem in some countries, however, not really in the Baltic Sea region. Um, the conclusions from this status report that we still have large data gaps that we need to fill in. Uh, we need to focus on upstream measures, however, a lot of um, uh, the pharmaceuticals 
come up from the wastewater treatment plants which are not designed to remove pharmaceuticals and we need to look at advanced treatment technologies to remove pharmaceuticals from the wastewater because upstream measures are uh, desirable but somewhat um, difficult when it comes to, to pharmaceuticals. Um, and in response to this, what we've done is to set up a regional cooperation platform within the policy area hazards. Um, we have three pillars in this platform. We collect uh, cluster transnational projects, projects that are focusing on pharmaceuticals in the environment from different perspectives, for example, advanced wastewater treatment technologies, waste management, um, other upstream measures such as criteria when it comes to public procurement, capacity building and so forth. Um, then we have what we call supporting activities where that could be, for example, uh, providing new knowledge through the status reports or uh, we have already um, supported specific development of or the development of specific projects to address specific policy issues. Uh, creating a stakeholder network for the projects to share knowledge, etc. And then we also aim to continue our uh, process together with Halcom to support the development of regional pro policy when it comes to pharmaceuticals in the Baltic region, uh, synthesize the results from the projects and activities that we're doing, and also uh, contribute to the strategy on the EU level. And with this uh, structure here, we hope to um, um, contribute to, to the reduction of pharmaceuticals to the environment as a whole. And uh, so I, I think I'll leave you with that and some um, web, web links and my email address for further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Another very interesting uh, presentation and, uh, uh, of course, very interesting that, again, a, a, a high problem area um, with some what seem like almost intractable uh, issues there. Uh, a quick question for you before we move on. You mentioned the status report, and I, I'm not sure if that's under embargo at the moment uh, until formal public publication, but are things actually improving or are they getting worse or is this new report uh, forming the baseline from which uh, future developments will be measured? Could you, could you tell us briefly? Uh, the status report will pr basically provide the baseline from where we're going to start off. It, it highlights some of the main gaps, uh, that way we don't have much information, for example, on the veterinary uh, pharmaceuticals. We, we don't really know how much is used where and so forth. We need to fill that gap. That's an, an issue, for example. Um, but we also, and it also highlights um, difficulties, where to prioritize. So that will, it will form a baseline. Uh, that's the main issue. Um, um, target for this report. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, very interesting. Please hang around uh, for, uh, for the question and answers at, uh, at the end. Uh, Maya, please could you pass over the presentation rights to Chris? Good day, everyone, wherever you are. I'm speaking to you from Nairobi, Kenya, from the UN Environment's headquarters. And um, I'm going to talk a bit about another wicked problem. Uh, this is more to do with the nutrient pollution, uh, that being mainly derivatives of phosphorus and nitrogen that end up into our coastal waters and our marine environment that causes our issues. And I'm just going to be talking about an initiative in the rehabilitation of Manila Bay in the Philippines under a project that is being funded by the Global Environment Facility. Um, this presentation was developed by our collaborators Hil Jacinto and Laura, Lara Soto of the University of the Philippines Marine Science Institute. Uh, so I'm giving the presentation on their behalf. Um, I'll be going not too in too, too much detail on uh, the slides. And I guess if there are any further questions, I'll ask, answer them at the end. And um, if there are any more technical detail, I'll refer you to the collaborators. 
Okay, we've also been working along with the University of Utrecht, uh, UNESCO, and a group called the, or partnership, called the Partnership for Environmental Management of the Seas of East Asia on this project. And um, we also working within what we call the Global Program of Action for the Protection of the Marine Environment from Land-Based Activities. It's a program that is based here at UN Environment, which is ex implementing the project, along with another partnership of experts called the Global Partnership on Nutrient Management. So that just sets the introduction. And interesting, in the Philippines, um, a lot of this work was motivated by a su Supreme Court decision, actually, where the civil society took the government to court on account of the, the um, elevated levels of pollution in Manila Bay, um, where the waters were becoming very unfit for um, um, human use, and also with severe um, ecosystem impacts, and of course with um, role on economic impacts, um, and social, and other um, outcomes. So the Supreme Court upheld this decision in 2008, mandating all the agencies that work within the, the provincial as well as the state level to start doing remedial work in Manila Bay. And this is where the project sought to support that activity. So the whole target is really to bring um, the quality of the water up to what they call an SB class status, which is really um, a designate for coastal and marine water quality. Okay? And the main, um, the main quality criteria has to do with um, suitability for bathing, swimming, um, recreational diving, and also um, the suitability for um, fish um, spawning. Okay, and there's a particular species called bangus, which is of importance. On the slide, you will see the quality parameters. And if you go online, actually, you can see the water quality parameters for that particular water quality class. So the idea is that all the interventions would need to be targeting um, improvements in um, source water from land that would end up in the marine environment so that we could reach those um, water quality parameter criteria at all these guidelines. So the, on the right side you'll see um, a satellite image of Manila Bay. Um, it's, it's quite a, a very densely populated area in a small footprint. The Manila, Metro Manila sits on Manila Bay. We have several rivers that drain into the, the bay. Um, Thing, rivers like the Pasig River, there are many different ecosystems in and around. There are significant forest areas, significant mangroves in the, the Balanga and Cavite provinces, extensive seagrass ecosystems. We have coral reefs. Uh, we have wetlands, quite extensive, um, wide variety of different types of wetlands. And the, the trend over time has been that Manila Bay has shown evidence of you know, pretty detrimental um, impacts due to harmful algal blooming in the bay. Um, so the scientists um, and the collaborators um, working on this project undertake to look at what's happening to Manila Bay. And essentially, the observations point to very low dissolved oxygen within the water, co within the water column in Manila Bay, thereby impacting um, 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 aquatic life and the ecosystems there. And essentially, um, we, we know that based on the water quality criteria, um, hypoxic conditions set in place when we have dissolved oxygen going below 2 to 3 milligrams per liter. And the class, the SB class, is that dissolved oxygen should be above uh, 0.5 milligrams per liter. So you can see clearly in, this, in these diagrams, which actually shows Manila Bay, and the red shadings are the observed uh, dissolved oxygen. And where you can see the darker shades basically is where dissolved oxygen is tending below 2 into 1 milligram per liter. And we can see that it's quite extensive in uh, Manila Bay and there is some variability um, over time and that has a lot to do um, with um, rainfall conditions and, and so on in terms of the amount of runoff that uh, gets into the bay. So we can see also here um, during the wet season, you can see how the dissolved oxygen really gets um, really gets low 
or depleted. And um, you can see some of these areas that are close to the, um, the shoreline in the very dark red shades. But certainly there are some wide, quite some wide bay averages uh, across the bay. And I would guess it has to do with um, circulation and so on. Some of, these, some of these would probably be better answered by our research collaborators. But the point is we can see clearly that Manila Bay is quite um, significantly impacted um, in terms of um, hypoxic conditions. This next slide uh, just discusses the depth or the thickness of the hypoxic layer um, that has been observed across wet and dry seasons. And um, I would just want to draw your attention to the, uh, the last row in that table where we're looking at the, the thickness in terms of average, average thickness in terms of the hypoxic layer in meters. And um, there is also this in the red bold where we see um, quite thick hypoxic layers um, up to 80 meters in some, of the, in some of the stations, in some of the places where they've observed or taken measurements. That reflects at least 80% of the water column being hypoxic, essentially um, not able to support uh, marine life. So that's quite significant and has a lot of, a lot of implications with respect to um, um, habitat suitability and means really what, what um, they call habitat compression. So it limits the suitability of the, of the habitat for survivability for, um, for marine life. So this next slide really is talking here about um, what we're seeing by what causes the, the components that causes um, hypoxia and eutrophication, which is essentially um, runoff of phosphates or, or phosphorus derivatives, phosphates, and also um, inorganic nitrogen. And uh, we can see here the two left um, diagrams shows the Manila Bay and the um, the concentrations of phosphates and, and total um, inorganic nitrogen um, on these two graphs. And on the right is a parameter called um, chlorophyll A. So this is, the, this is um, chlorophyll, that is the floating um, um, algae that blooms in response to nitrogen, in response to nutrients. So essentially, phosphorus and nitrogen as it would in fertilizers and so on, as it would nourish plant growth on land, it similarly nourishes plant growth in the water. And essentially when the, the plants grow, the algae grows and becomes very dense, eventually it would die. And when it rots in the water column, it, it depletes the oxygen, it, it, it absorbs the oxygen. And so it makes the water column what we call hypoxic. Okay? And clearly the, the locations where we're seeing those um, spikes in <clears throat> nitrogen and phosphorus has a lot to do with where the, the rivers are, deri are, are draining um, runoff from domestic sources, from industrial sources, agricultural sources, and untreated sewage waste. And you heard um, um, some of these being raised by Jenny in terms of on the pharmaceutical side of things. So the problems of Manila Bay essentially can be summarized really as, um, you know, we have significant pollution, hypoxia eutrophication where we're seeing um, dissolved oxygen very low, elevated nutrient contents near the river mouth, and a trend in decreasing oxygen values over time. Also harmful algal blooms and persistent red tides. I think many people would be aware that sometimes these um, harmful algal blooms where fish and shellfish taking these toxins from these algae can actually kill people. And in fact, there's some statistics that they've presented here where there have been some incidents of deaths caused by um, some of these poisoning cases due to the harmful algal blooms nourished by nutrients that run off uh, from land. We also have issues with respect to heavy metals and oil spills, and that has a lot to do with the, the industrial development around. But they did note that, in fact, um, there has been a decline, I suppose, due to better regulation and so on. Um, organic contaminants, there's been, there has been observations of, of these sort of contaminants in shellfish, but and fish and shellfish, but they they do in fact recognize that some of those are within the the acceptable limits for health risks. But do note that offshore Manila, the city, there is um, higher concentrations and possibly 
as the city grows, it could become worse. Uh, just to illustrate um, the Manila itself, Manila, the city of Manila, you can see Manila is resting um, here within the bay. And you can see between 1988 and 2014, the extensive um, growth, and that's the gray areas, how Manila Bay has really, on Manila, sorry, has grown tremendously. And of note, the cities near the bay are densely populated and most have very limited um, sewage connectivity to treatment systems. So a lot of this waste is entering the bay untreated. Okay? They say that um, less than 30% of the population, which is at a density of 19,000 per square kilometer, um, have sewage uh, connections. Sorry to Quite cut in, Chris, uh, uh, yeah. just being a little bit aware of time. We ha have okay. a minute left. Okay, thank you. And then this graph just shows the, um, the, the land use, the complex land use that's within the, within the bay. Um, and just to note, there are 31 million people that live around the area. So you can imagine the, 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 the stresses on the environment. And we mentioned about the sewage connectivity or lack thereof, which is somewhat improving. So the, the work that we're doing is essentially trying to model nutrient loading into the, into the bay and essentially trying to figure out the nutrient loads as a result of the different activities, determine the efficiency of the sewage connections, looking at um, reducing nutrients from detergents as well, like phosphates and so on, and try to use this modeling um, to come up with effective policies and strategies. And what they found in this modeling is that a lot of the nitrogen loads come from domestic um, outflows, and also the phosphorus as well is a bigger part of the nutrients. Um, agriculture plays a big role as well in both cases, and this slide essentially shows you the different con color concentrations show where the phosphorus and nitrogens are coming from, the nitrogen in the pink and the phosphorus in the, in the green. So you can see this is concentrated around the main cities. So what are the possible res um, responses in terms of all of this work in moving forward? Well. They want to significantly um, reduce phosphate-free or promote phosphate-free detergent. Um, continue doing the more studies by province by province, looking at where issues may be occurring. Better inventory of, of livestock operations to reduce waste generation. Improve citizen science as a way to heighten awareness and action. And then also do things like environmental report cards as well to, to drive decision making. So I know that was a compressed to the end, but this is for more information. You can visit us at the GP at UN Environment, and this is my email uh, if you need further information. So thank you all. And thank you uh, very much, Chris. I think you did a, a great job of, of covering that, and of course, many thanks for stepping in at the uh, at the last moment. A quick question before we move on to Eleanor: um, How typical are the problems of uh, Manila Bay in your experience in terms of, you know, large growing coastal conurbations? Can you say a few words on that? Yeah, what we see in Manila Bay is, is quite typical and in fact in the cities in um, Southeast Asia, in Africa, we see very similar trends where, you know, there's a lot of urban sprawl where um, there just isn't the capacity to invest in wastewater treatment systems. Um, you see, for example, where um, um, communities have moved from what would be agrarian um, into, into built-up environments, but the infrastructure just is, is not catching up. So that's a big problem that we do have with this whole source of sea issue. Um, the, the, the nature of the, of the contamination tends to change the, the intensity of it. And it's something that we at the GPA have been working with countries to see how we could come up with integrated approaches to manage things like um, land use planning, um, wastewater management, um, um, sustainable agriculture and so on. So it's a very multifaceted type of problem, but it's very, very typical across many parts of the globe. And also in parts, large cities in um, Latin America as well. We're seeing this and it's very typical. Thanks, Chris. Um, and uh, with one eye on the time, I'm sorry, uh, sorry to keep you waiting, Elena, but Maya, if you could pass over to Elena. Uh, okay, um, uh, I'm happy to to be with you in this uh, webinar. Just to, I'm Elena Giusta. I'm working for the National Institute for Environmental Research and in, um, Protection and Research in Italy. It is an environmental, uh, is a governmental institution. Uh, it is the national focal point of the um, uh, AONET. 
the mercury contamination of the marine coastal uh, uh, determine a high uh, pollution of the marine environment, such as chemical or petrochemical industries, harbors, and military areas, agriculture and mining settlements. Mercury is a heavy metal present in the environment, both of natural. Um, Yes, mercury is a heavy metal present in the environment, both for natural causes, volcanic activity, and rock erosion, and for anthropic activities. It is widespread, persistent contaminant. As organic form, known as methyl mercury, is a lipid soluble and tends to bioaccumulate. It's dangerous for the environment and human health. The most important sources of mercury in the marine coastal areas, areas are due to petrochemical activities, mining, extraction, paints. Um, there are the coastal sites impacting, the Italian coastal sites impacted by mercury contamination. Orbitello area, uh, this Orbitello Lake area is included um, uh, uh, in the community uh, interest sites. It is characterized by shallow water um, and uh, it is um, separated. Uh, the, the, uh, the region is an important ore district due to the presence of many hydrothermal deposits determined by tertiary age volcanism, which have been exploited since the Etruscan age. The area is interested by several mineralization sites, uh, but the most interesting is located in Terra Rossa. The mining extraction was active from 1873 until 1958, when stopped for the depletion of minerals. The extraction method of iron manganese minerals determined a high production of residual waste containing several metals, including mercury, which were discharged directly in the lagoon and enriched the mercury content in the sediment. The lagoon, also used for aquaculture plants and fishing of several species, is also affected by anthropogenic impact, which determines the environmental contamination. Uh, Orbitello area, um, high concentration of mercury, uh, in the eastern side of the area, close to the main implant, were registered. In the same area, the analysis carried out on the fish tissues of several species sh uh, showed higher levels of mercury, one of those also exceeding limits imposed by the European mercury uh, regulation in food. Uh, the Grado Marano area, uh, is characterized by shallow water separated by several waterways. It is used for mussels, uh, mussel and cell water claims plants. Um, the main sediment supply is given by the Isonzo River, uh, which uh, flows into the Gulf of Trieste. The train sediments with high contents of mercury deriving uh, from long activity of Idria mine in Slovenia. The sediments are dispersed along the coast southwest, entering the lagoon main through east tidal inlet. Another significant input is given from the Osa, Osa River, which is in the past collected the discharges of chloroalkyl alkali plant using mercury cells located in the north of the site. It worked from uh, 1950 until early 19th, and its products determine a strong contamination of soil, groundwater, and sediment. The impact of both rivers hit the central east sector of the lagoon. The lagoon. Um, um, always the, the Grano Marano Lagoon, higher by accumulation in the fish liver in comparison with mussel, together with higher um, with higher uh, values uh, than uh, um, permitted by the, the European regulation, higher by accumulation in the muscles from side uh, D in the picture, together with the higher than uh, the um, European regulation limit for saltwater claims. Transplanted muscle show in site D higher trend to by accumulation. Augusta Bay in Sicily, 
uh, is, uh, this bay is affected by high anthropogenic impact due to strong past and still active industrial activities. It is a natural bay closed by artificial dams in early uh, 60s. Along the coast, mainly Pliocene glaze and Quaternity biocalcarinates outcrops, which are the main feeders of marine sand in the Augusta Harbor. The water depth is deeper in correspondence with the main inlet and shallower water close the coast, where the hard substrate outcrops on the sea bottom. Water circulation is very weak and alternates its direction with different tide conditions. The environmental status of marine area is highly influenced by past activities of chloroalkyl plant, which was active from 1958 to 2003. Over uh, 500 tons of mercury was directly discharged in the sea from 1958 to 1979 through Vallone de la Neve Challenge. In 2005, mercury cells were removed. In the site, there is also the important town of Augusta and the Navy area. High concentration uh, in this area, uh, there are high concentration uh, of mercury in the sediment, mainly in the southern area close to the industrial plants. Similar results are evident in the organism collected close to the industrial piles and transplanted ones that show very high mercury concentration over um, the um, uh, limit permitted by the, the European uh, directives. This data points out that the, the capacity of accumulation for this contaminant, both in the muscle and liver or, organism, with level higher than the, the European regulation. The key role played by Augusta Arbor in the mercury contamination of the Mediterranean Sea. Augusta Bay is associated to the outflow of bottom waters that intercept surface mesoscale ocean circulation with potential widespread contaminant distribution effect, effects at basin scale. Finally, a narrow continental margin off of Augusta coast associated to steep slope and several gullies creates preferential transfer routes for polluted sediments from the internal Augustan basin. So the potential release of mercury from contaminated sediments could certainly influence the mercury contents of the Levantine intermediate waters with an effective mechanism of large-scale contamination of the entire Mediterranean with unpredictable effects on the base. Conclusion, um, anthropic activities can have long-term impacts on marine environment due, for instance, to sediments that absorb many priority substances. Even if anthropic activities are no longer carried out, mining, industrial processes, and etc., marine environment can still be hit by their adverse effects. In order to evaluate the environmental quality of a marine coastal area in view of its exploitation for leisure, tourism, aquaculture, fishing, it is important to verify the sediments quality and how they interact with the surrounding environment. This is, even, this is even more relevant for those contaminants which bioaccumulate and can be transferred elsewhere along the trophic chain. Thank you, <laughs> and sorry for the problem. <laughs> no, sorry from our side for the, the technical troubles, uh, Elena, and many thanks for an excellent recovery there. Uh, the, the, <laughs> we could see the presentation very well. Before we move on to Begid, I have a very quick question for you, and that is, apart from mercury, what other substances are monitored in the sediments to assess the environmental uh, quality of the marine areas? Yes. Um, substances that are characterized by persistent bioaccumulate and toxic substances such as uh, pers uh, persistent organic uh, pollutants, um, such as uh, polychlorinated uh, biphenyls and the organic chlorinated pesticide, dioxin, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and other metals as cadmium or lead, and the organic uh, organic uh, 
uh, metallics as uh, uh, TBT, tribulitin. Many thanks for that, Elena. Uh, okay. Now, I, before we move on to uh, the questions, um, I'd like to ask uh, Maya to unmute Begita's microphone so Begita can uh, quickly uh, share her reflections. I unmuted myself. <laughs> ah, well done. So over to you, Begita. Thank you. Yeah, no, so I'll be very brief, but I think it's been a very interesting collection of presentations uh, covering all these, uh, I mean, those the types of issues that we know have been aware of and have been battling for decades, like nutrients and heavy metals. And then uh, I wouldn't call them emerging pollutants anymore, but the pollutants that we're gaining more and more knowledge about in uh, recent decades, like plastics and pharmaceuticals. Uh, and I'm encouraged by the fact there's a lot of, I understand, there's a wealth of information and experiences behind these 10 minutes per presentation. So there's a lot to dig into here. And I think it's also encouraging to see, I think there's a lot of opportunities to learn also from the uh, initiatives that have been presented here, that perhaps the work that is now being undertaken in the Baltic can provide a good example to other regions when they are starting to look towards dealing with pharmaceuticals. Um, I'm glad to see that the UNEP GPA is working with uh, nutrient pollution still and trying to address uh, the challenges that we need to battle when we uh, continue into the area of urbanization. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, it's been an interesting set of presentations and I'm looking forward to the questions. Yes, yeah, I think as well it's been uh, very interesting. In terms of questions, we time for a, a few quick ones. Uh, first of all, I will uh, start with Peter. I hope you're still with us, Peter. But if you can unmute your microphone and uh, make some noise. Hello, I'm, uh, I'm here in the live. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a quick question. Are there regional differences in the uh, quantities of plastic litter reaching the ocean? And if so, why? Uh, good question. Um, yes, I mean, there are, is, is the very simple answer. And uh, it's partly due to how much materials uh, we use uh, per head. And in some countries, that's much greater. And in fact, it tends to be, uh, our use of plastic is, is, tends to be related to, crudely, to GDP. The richer we are, the more we use. Uh, conversely, um, countries uh, which uh, are less economically developed tend to have less well-developed systems for dealing with waste. And in addition, um, uh, richer countries often often use them as a destination for dealing with, uh, with their waste. There's, a, there's, a, there's quite a global trade in waste, um, some legal, some illegal. Um, and that compounds the problem. And so you end up with some very serious sort of human health issues around that. So it's, it's partly to do with our use and it's partly to do with our ability to, in terms of governance and technical ability to deal with it. Thanks, thanks Peter for, for giving a concise uh, answer to that one. Uh, moving on to um, Jenny next. Jenny, if you could unmute your microphone. I'm here, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, which techniques are there available for removing uh, pharmaceuticals from wastewater? Are you aware of any that uh, uh, ones in terms of headlines you can share with us? Um, yeah, there are a number of, of techniques and, and actually the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency just published this week a report um, to the Swedish government where we have list, well, listed and, and gone through all the different techniques and also recommend the Swedish government to to take a look at implementing some of these techniques to remove pharmaceuticals from Swedish wastewater treatment plants uh, with a cost-benefit analysis. Um, so there are, for example, ozonation uh, techniques that will remove some of the pharmaceuticals and there are also um, 
active carbon, which would absorb uh, other types of pharmaceuticals. So they're a little bit different. The techniques are, are, quite, are different in their nature. Um, perhaps a combination of the two would be the best one. Also, I think it's important to, to notice that if you um, uh, implement advanced treatment technologies, it will not only help for reducing the release of pharmaceuticals, but also many other types of pollutants. For example, microplastics, but also other microcontaminants. So there are multiple benefits of uh, upgrading wastewater treatment plants when you want to reduce uh, contaminants to the marine environment. So With Jenny, that said, of course, it's upstream measures are always the best to go to the yeah. source. <laughs> Sorry, uh, is uh, the report that you mentioned, is it available in English or will it, the executive summary be made available in English? There is a, a, an executive summary in English, but the report, unfortunately, is in Swedish. It will, it's available on the Swedish um, Environmental Protection Agency's uh, home page. I can provide a link if you are interested. Many thanks for that, Jenny. And and moving on to uh, Elena. Elena, are you with us? Yes. Here we are. <laughs> yes. Uh, the last question of the day. How can marine pollution be uh, tackled from an environmental point of view, in your opinion, from, from your experiences? What would you recommend? What are the headlines? Well, uh, yes. Um, a combined action uh, is needed to manage both sea and land intervention. On the ground, it is not sufficient to interrupt an activity to completely cancel contamination because contaminated areas, uh, fields, aquifer, surface waters, will bring contaminants into the marine environment till these transport routes are blocked. As for the sea, the presence of contaminated sediments influences the possibility of carrying out activities such as tourism, fishing, aquaculture, etc. And long-lasting monitoring is needed to control the trend toward a better quality of the environment. The presence of contaminants uh, also influences the sediments removal for a dredging and infrastructure building, etc., because these activities require eco-friendly technologies which avoid uh, the contaminants circulation and monitoring operation to check their effectiveness. Thank you, Elena. I'm, uh, I'm sorry to say that's all we have in, in terms of uh, uh, time for questions right now. For those of you uh, that we didn't have time to respond to, we're going to look at uh, getting uh, the presenters to respond. Maya will be taking care of that. As mentioned, this is the second webinar in the series. The next one is titled uh, Too Little or Too Much mitigating downstream impacts from altered water flows. And that's going to be happening on June the 13th at exactly the same time as today. So please mark your calendars uh, for that one already, if you would. Um, in terms of uh, any burning uh, additional issues, as I mentioned, mine will take care of those. If something extra comes up, please, uh, please send a mail here to uh, Maya and uh, she'll be able to get back to you. We're always looking to improve the uh, quality of our work, so we'd be grateful if you could use a couple of minutes to respond to the, uh, the, uh, the feedback form that you'll receive automatically. And of course, uh, just looking at the middle point there, uh, I should have mentioned that we're going to be making all the webinar recordings and slides available uh, from our uh, website via the link here. Thanks for sticking with us. We went a little bit over time, unfortunately, but uh, I hope you found it worthwhile. I'd like to conclude today's session by thanking the presenters for taking their time to share their knowledge with us, and also to Maya for her uh, valuable backroom support. I'd also like to thank you, the participants, for taking the time to join us today, and uh, as always, wish you a very good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Thank you.